Please note that though this is a spoiler-free review of the subject, I do spoil the series and or franchise leading up to this particular entry. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I try to jam-pack my videos with as much content and as much detail as I possibly can. Anything I feel I can comment on and that I feel you might be interested in, I pretty much put in the video. I try not to repeat myself and talk fairly fast. If the video is too long for you, I have recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. Movie review of X-Men 3 The Long Sit. I mean, on its last legs. I mean, characters stand around. The last stand, that's it. We have three different plots competing for attention. Jean Grey survived the ending of the second movie in a way that works in the comics but really flies in the face of the mostly realistic tone that these movies have worked so hard to, to establish and maintain. Her powers wrapped her in a cocoon of telekinetic energy. I want to say that's the exact phrasing. I completely buy that in the comics, but not here. Not, not at all. And she is becoming the Phoenix, which, you know, going, yeah, basically this incredibly powerful being and a very destructive being as well. A cure that eliminates the mutant X gene. I want to say that this is the first of the movies to mention that at all. And yeah, again, doesn't really... Anyway, and apparently it is canon because I'm pretty sure it's the same idea that Deadpool... The, the cure eliminates the X gene, but the, the stuff they do to Deadpool is supposed to provoke the X gene so that the, the mutation inherent in him, I guess inherent in everybody, will actually, you know surface. And, you know, obviously this cure is, you know, really sends ripples through the mutant community. And, yeah, some... Yeah, I'll, I'll get to that. And Magneto is increasing membership in the Brotherhood by dozens, maybe a hundred. The, the, the Cure protesters, we see them in a couple of different scenes. And basically, the, I think the idea is that each time their chant is slightly different. They're, they're protesting the Cure. So they're saying, you know, they're, they're, we, don't, we don't really see any counter-protesters. Basically, there are people going into the cure, go, going in and taking the cure, and then there are these protesters against the cure. And I, I guess the idea is that it's supposed to evoke this sense of, like, you know, the Planned Parenthood thing, where there are protesters outside, you know, and, and then people trying to get in there, trying to, you know, for, for various reasons, use their services. The first time the chant is no to the cure. And that, you know, that works. Then the second time, it's we don't need a cure, with, with the, the intonation fairly neutral among words. Then the third time, I guess they just ran out of different ones, and they didn't want to use that exact, they didn't want really to use either of those again. So instead, it's now we, we don't need a, sorry, we don't need a cure with intonation on don't. And I just, I feel like couldn't they have just gone with other, one of the other ones or, or possibly say to know the cure or just just something because it just feels like, you know, just after after a while, you know, they, they got a little tired and, and someone was like, can we, it, do we have any other chance? No? 
can we change the intonation of this? I, I guess what I'm saying is, if you're gonna go in that direction, just just go the whole way. Have have chants where you know a chant per intonation in per word intonation, basically. You know, we don't need a cure. We don't need a cure. We do need a cure, and we don't need a cure. That that would make it so much better. When Brian Singer left this movie, he took with him the composer and editor, cinematographer, the two good writers, apparently. Uh, to be fair, I want to say Simon Kinberg is the one who did redeem himself with Days of Future Past, and the production designer. So, yeah. And they're... Yeah, they are sorely missed. The two writers on this were initially told that they were to told to write different scripts and then the best elements of them would be combined similar to how the first was written instead they agreed that they would work together maybe con considering what we ended up with maybe they should have gone with the original plan the Brett Ratner was just the the wrong choice for this. Basically, he part part of the reason he was chosen was because it was going to be it was clearly going to be a really rushed production, and he had done a good job on the rush production of Rush Hour. I don't think that he really. I think it's it's probably giving him too much credit to say that he should have known that he didn't have you know he couldn't produce anything as smart as the first two and basically you know he just he thought hey this looks like it might be some fun action and and he clearly you know others have noted this has some of the best action and if you if you completely turn off your brain and just watch the action scenes you know they're they're generic. They're it's it's like the Men in Black three thing. Some of these action scenes could be in any movie. There's there's a scene where Wolverine charges this guy, who's growing, like bone, you know, elongated sharp bones out of his arms, and then he breaks those off and throws them at Wolverine. And what it boils down to is, he's essentially just it's it's. An assassin using throwing knives. It might as well be, you know, I want to say navajas. Man, it's been too long since I watched Desperado. But you know, just it's a, it's a knife throwing character. That's all. It's there's no reason for this guy to be a mutant. It's yeah, that's he he might as well be, you know, grabbing these knives out of a belt or something. So so yeah, generic, but. You know, it's it's fast paced and filmed well, and yeah, it it was basically the the studio messed up by giving him the movie basically, and I don't really, I think he did care, and I think he did as well as he could, and like in the commentary track, he sounds like he's fairly satisfied with it, although, you know. I suppose directors on commentary tracks aren't necessarily going to admit if they think they did a terrible job. Although apparently, according to that one crack video, Joe Schumacher did admit that in the Batman and Robin commentary. Basically, yeah, the the when when you look at his other movies, you know, with the, the this tendency towards kind of dumb action comedy you know they're they're fine they're enjoyable enough if you take them completely at face value and I mean, yeah the, the man can do comedy and action fairly decently now this is based on the comic books the, the Dark Phoenix Saga and Gifted and you know this movie has the the fastball special I want to say it's called which 
is in a number of the comics, but actually in the Dark Phoenix comic, they do a reverse one where instead of Colossus throwing Wolverine, Wolverine throws Colossus once, and yeah. And as others have noted, Colossus has one line. Wait, or do I have that backwards? I, I want to say that's how the fastballs play. Yeah, it's been a little while since I read Dark Phoenix. I reread it for this, but yeah, it's been some weeks now. Colossus is in the entire movie, but he only has one line. He was supposed to have more, but they ended up cutting all of that. So now he just stands around for most of the movie, and yeah. I appreciate the escalation. In the first movie, you have Wolverine fighting Mystique and Saber, you know, separately. In the second one, you have him fighting a dozen, you know, human, like, you know, a dozen of striker soldiers, you know, in a row. And then in this, he fights at least a dozen mutants total and half a dozen in a row in one scene. The problem is that the scenes aren't very good. And again, he'll, you know, he'll stab and cut people, yeah. Some of the deleted scenes are really, really bad. In one of the most important parts of the movie, that basically it's 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 a situation that has to be handled very carefully, and Wolverine and the other X Men are basically just there in case excuse me that they need to get they need to become part of the. Yeah, they're they're not gonna just run into it, you know, without thinking. And at the end of the day, in in the actual film, he does get into it, but it seems like it's because he feels like they can't, you know, it's too risky to just wait. In the movie, it's that he's taunted into it like a child. It's it's ridiculous. And with you know, with the end of the second movie, he he no longer wants to learn about his past, which eliminates the the drive of the character and one of the most interesting elements of it. It's there really isn't you know, I mean they do interesting things with the character in later movies. But in this, they don't, you know, they, they've, you know, technically, it's not that the movie takes it away because the second movie did close that door. Basically, you know, the, the only way we were going to find out more about his past was a prequel, which they went ahead and messed up later. But what they should have done was give him something new. But, yeah, they just did not do so. And instead, it's just, yeah, he, he's angry a lot. He kind of snaps at people and is con constantly gruff and such. It's, I think the writers thought that that was just how Logan is, rather than, you know, there, there are things that he's, he's kind of a loner and he's, you know, he pretends to not care that much, but in this entire movie, he's just hanging around the the X Mansion. You know, again, in the first two movies, there was a reason that he was there, and actually, in both, big part of that reason was finding out where he came from. And in this, with it gone, he says early on, "I'm just passing through," but he never does leave, and. Yeah, he's just there and angry a lot. I suppose part of the reason is supposed to be that, you know, with Gene coming back, yeah, but 
their scenes together are not that compelling and really he doesn't it doesn't give him a lot of drive he's he ends up very reactionary just you know I don't mean that as the in the extremist sense but basically he's he only reacts to things that happen he doesn't go out there you know in yeah in the first two movies if he feels like you know when when he thinks okay this is something I can handle in this or that way he actually goes out and tries to do that he doesn't know doesn't always work out but he at least tries in this he's just waiting around it characters in this really just wait around for things to happen that they're that the writers have figured out how the characters should react to the, the writers don't really know anything you know don't don't know how to give the characters drive they're always just reacting things things happen and work out in a way that gives them a course of action but it's not it's it's dumb luck the the cure appeals to some but others won't hear of it and storm is one of them and there she she's given really dumb borderline offensive lines like she she legitimately says what kind of coward would would take this cure and it's like who are you to tell every single mutant that they don't have the right to yeah it's just and and she says you know oh there's nothing wrong with any of us you know i understand her not wanting it to be referred to as a disease which at that point it hasn't been and you know in the comics it's also spoken of as a disease but you know some mutants can't have a normal life with their mutation some of them can't pass you know beast even points this out you don't shed on the furniture she she can hide her powers just fine you know quite a few mutants can't or their powers you know, part of her backstory is that she didn't always have control of it and she was persecuted early on after early on losing control of it. But the way it is today, you know, she could, if she weren't part of the X-Men, no one would really know that she was a mutant and we haven't in these movies seen her have trouble controlling her powers or seem uncomfortable with having the powers so yeah there's you know who is she to talk about it at all she you know she barely has a dog in the fight the the you know she ends up really obnoxious and irritating and Rogue does as well. Really, the the women in this, which is a sure fire, you know, sure sign of writers who don't necessarily like women that much and think that if women are aggressive, then they must end up obnoxious. Really, the the you know, I also talked about it with through will you know via Wolverine really this movie mistakes people being angry and you know snapping at each other for you know mistakes that for drama storm's action is pretty good there's more of it there's more variation to it it's more fast paced they even give her a nemesis although how this other character is supposed to be much of a match for her is anyone's guess because all it is is that she has super speed but yeah like I said this is in part based on gifted which f funny enough actually mocks the black leather of these films so yeah and in both the comic and this movie the cure is forced upon a mutant beast is clearly interested in the mutant in the cure and 
there is some you know it, it seems like maybe Beast wants the cure for himself Beast is a cabinet member yes a few years after a you know authorized by the president strike on US soil targeting mutant children which led to two consecutive genocide attempts I, I don't buy for a second that this soon he would you know someone so obviously a mutant would have such an important position and it's really it's you know it's there because they wanted you know this also this is just a few years after there was a legitimate like the Senate was seriously concerned registering all mutants which was you know painted as well we can't trust them so we just yeah it's way too soon and it's yeah it's it's written that way because they wanted that to be the way not you know they don't even attempt to make it sound like it makes sense and he does say all oh, my stars and garters like in the comic Kevin Feige insisted which you know this was just before the you know the premiere of the MCU Magneto partially crashes a truck which he knows Mystique is in and he may or may not know that she's just barely restrained in there and he does seem to know which is somehow true that she won't be hurt by the truck crash this is how cops hurt people intentionally and they quote unquote only speed they don't actually crash the car and when Magneto is introduced they're they're not he's he's very carefully waiting for someone to say something that it's it's basically this barely organized mutant gathering where a a guy is like saying no 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 it's okay we just we need to form a committee and then tell the non mutants of the world that when they talk about it as a cure what we were I get that they wanted to make sure that we could see why Magneto would convince these people, but I don't think they needed to make him quite that weak. The the guy Magneto takes over for there, but anyway, Magneto is basically just waiting for them to say something that he can dramatically counter. And in this introduction, it's very clear that the writers know that Magneto survived the Holocaust and they really really want the audience to know that they know so the first several lines are just you know he he said you know no one talks about extermination they just do it and then a little bit after there's this like gang I, I want to say they're called like the Omegas or something of mutants and there's someone you know where, where's if you're so proud of being mutant where's your mark and he's like, I have been mocked once, and a needle shall never again touch my skin. And, you know, as if that line wasn't enough, he, he makes sure to show as well, see, see, I have, a, you know, this was something that was very subtly used in the first two movies to establish this is, you know, this is a Holocaust survivor. And in the first movie, it's the first real indication that yes that that boy you saw at the very start in Poland 1944 he grew up to be this man that you see before you know because you see the yeah and in this they have to really underline it with yeah and this this gang the Omegas all have these you know tattoos of the you know I guess the I, yeah I'm not certain where the the but but yeah, of of like you know, and a tattoo that very distinctly says Omega, and I think this was ma mainly so that they could have you know it, it ends up basically 
forming an arrow pointing down the cleavage of one of the members, the, the fast runner, who, you know, not long after this, maybe a year after or so, would appear on Heroes as the, you know, the woman who, when she gets upset, people near her die. So she, she may have been attracted to this kind of role. And, you know, given that she's also in that, it's clear that she, she can actually be better than she is in this. It's, it's mainly the writing that's at fault for this. This movie's, yeah. And, you know, Magneto's turned cold and, figuratively speaking, ugly, and they completely eliminate this kind of catty quality that he had in the first two. And it's like, I, I, again, I don't know if they just, if they didn't realize it or if they didn't get it. I suppose it's possible that they just didn't like it, but it's completely gone, and it really, like, you know, whether or not you like it, I quite, I really like that, that aspect, that he's always this kind of cat, and Mystique is at times as well, but she speaks much less than he does. He likes to, to talk a, a lot, you know, but at least it, it was, it was a significant part of his character, it was ever present. He was always, you know, speaking in this sort of, as that was I say. And, and, yeah, just, the, the, you know, basically, Magneto is now in, he's, he's someone who causes a lot in the, you know, yeah, he, he really, drives the plot forward and he's a very destructive, very dangerous presence much like he was in the first movie when really, given that they're dealing with Phoenix that, that they're tackling the Phoenix storyline he should have been you know, less yeah, he should have been closer to what he is in the second movie where he he helps out and he's he definitely he has a presence, but he's not because you can't have Magneto the focus when you're also doing Phoenix. That leads to Phoenix just standing there and yeah, that's what happens. You know, really if you had rewritten this to where Phoenix did a lot of what Magneto does in this movie, that could maybe have worked. It it would have been basically they should have either they they should have chosen between Magneto and Phoenix and them not doing so. Apparently the studio really wanted the cure and Magneto. And and those two also if if you took Phoenix entirely out of this, yeah, that could more or less work. And the the writers insisted on having Phoenix. And I get that because we just had the the sequel baiting of, you know, this, this almost promise that Phoenix will be, you know, the first movie we can tell that her powers are, you know, we're, we're told she doesn't have full control and it's dangerous for her to use the machine. She uses the machine and, you know, there at the very end she uses her powers in a very, you know, in a very focused manner. It, it appears to really strain her to, to be maybe more than she's used to being able to do. Then the second one, we're told ever since the first movie, her powers have been growing. Over the course of the film, we see her, you know, struggling with containing them and such. At the end, she sacrificed herself. It would make sense that she be in this movie, and they were also looking to stop making team movies and do solo spin-offs. So it might have been now or never, you know, although now it appears like they might do it with a, you know, the, the Game of Thrones actress instead, but, or try to do it again. But they really, they should have killed their darlings because as it is, it just, you could, you could so easily remove Phoenix 
from this movie and you just have to rewrite some stuff for so much of the movie she just stands there doing nothing and I've watched this movie many times I can't tell what Phoenix wants I, I get that she doesn't she seems provoked by if if someone is like trying to limit her powers or talk her out of using her powers or something like that but other than that it doesn't really seem like she has any drive where the in the comic it's you know it's basically this kind of power corrupts thing where she's she's so drunk on how much power she has there's one point where she just flies out in space cuz she can cuz she feels like it and that makes sense you know and that's compelling that's scary you know to see someone you used to fight alongside used to love suddenly be this you know just doing whatever they feel like and killing people and yeah that and in this it just feels like she doesn't yeah she doesn't have any real drive either there, there are several things she does where we never find out why she does them at all the to, to return to, to Magneto's role I understand maybe they didn't want to do Magneto having as little of an impact you know being let's let's say bit player like he was in the second movie they didn't want to do that two movies in a row maybe they wanted Magneto to really dominate in the last big team film but yeah and and I I do understand it is the the kind of thing where as long as Magneto is alive, you you kind of have to deal with him in the films. You have to figure out something for him to do. And part of the problem is in this, it's not that different from the first movie. It's it's almost like the, the reverse. He hates the cure. He thinks that it's an awful thing. So he's basically it's it's kind of like the reverse in in of, of the first one. In the first one, he's trying to turn humans and mutants against their will to influence how you know yeah how mutants will be treated around the world by the powerful in this he's trying to prevent humans from turning mutants back into regular humans and he's also like talking about he you know they'll they'll have it in control they will they themselves might use it against mutants that oppose them so yeah they just reversed it and that's it there's you know at least in the first movie it was like okay he's trying to the way he sees it you know it's it's worth risking killing a lot of people to improve to, to for sure improve the the status of mutants worldwide you know you it's it's one of those great villains where we understand and maybe even almost agree with his goal to, to, to you know, as he says that he just wants, you know, in, in reality he wants mutants to be treated as superior to, to humans, not equal. But if we said he wanted to treat, he wanted equal treatment, then yeah, you know, we agree with his goal, just not his methods. But in this one, it's just, I guess, world domination of course yeah it's it's and and that's the thing you know the the and then the later movies of course you know in in days of future past he's almost you know it's it's it resembles the second movie but then there's still some you know I'm not gonna give that away here but yeah, they, they still do something interesting with it. You know, first class, it's just that he he's basically just one of the X-Men there for a while. And then Apocalypse, 
you know, I suppose I shouldn't give that away, but yeah, you know, the the it's always a challenge to to figure out how to deal with really it might have been the smartest to to kill Magneto off in the second movie so that they didn't have to keep dealing with him. But as it is, you know, and, and in this case it was only that they had to deal with you know Yeah, th this continuity, Magneto, basically, I mean, yeah, the, the future stuff and Days of Future Past might as well not really be there, basically, but as it is in the finished film, I know that they cut some stuff, but, you know, still having him, yeah, you know, you, you do want to, you want to use him, you want to have something big with him, and, you know, he is he's been in the comics for, you know, he was there right from the start. He was in the first X-Men comic. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, and it's especially difficult in movies because, yeah, you know, I mean, if, if they did a movie where Magneto wasn't in it at all, yeah, that would, that would be really, so each time they have to come up with something for him to do, and you know, mixed result results all along the way. But yeah, in this one, they just said, "Well, let's let him be the main villain again, just like in the first movie." And I mean, the the you know, it they they reversed what they reversed his goal and or or the conflict situation, and they gave him a lot more soldiers. That's it. I, don't get me wrong, I understand wanting to keep Ian McKellen in, you know, in this and, and give him a prominent role. I completely understand that. He is ubiquitous in the first two movies, and he does what he can with the material he's given here, but they really should have chosen either him or Phoenix. Now, Phoenix herself, like in the comic, here she is, it's, it's the, you know, split personality, disassociative personality disorder kind of thing. She dies and then comes back, but isn't the same, which also means it only took them three films to get to that no one dies, you know, and stays dead in comic books. In this, when when she uses her powers, it affects her surroundings several meters away, like gravity will reverse and things will fly around or away or you know seem to kind of hover in the air or stuff like that. I get that that's like a way to show that, you know, when she uses her powers, it's the, the her powers are so strong that even just her starting to use them or using them a little bit has a huge effect but it means that it's really difficult to tell what she's using her powers on when she even means to be using her powers and yeah we get to see Xavier's dark side a little bit the intro with with the younger Jean has this they they use you know they with 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 CGI or something they they de-aged Xavier and Magneto and it's real uncanny in Valley not X Men it you know this was back when they really did not yeah they they the technology was just not there and it really like very recently it it got to be there i'd say that civil war was when it was really convincing and it was very close in ant-man but back when this came out yeah no and like in you know the the 
Kitty Pride. You know, they finally settled on, you know, the third movie, third time they cast, you know, third person they cast in the role, with, with the idea being, you know, she was going to have a more prominent role, so they needed a proper actress, someone who really had experience, and then they dropped it, and, you know, she didn't appear again until, you know, Days of Future Past and the future scenes, so, yeah. They they considered Maggie Grace, but you know then they were like, oh, she's too old. She's like four years older, three, three and a half, to be more precise, I believe, than Ellen Page. And two years after this movie, she played a seventeen-year-old in Taken. So, yeah. Iceman isn't bad in this. The the you know. He's one of the smarter characters, and the, the lines aren't bad. I should just briefly... Rogue, in the first two, it was this thing of they, they both, you know, they, they, they're they clearly in love, and they... And well, in the first one, it was, you know, in the very early stages of that, you might say. But, you know, clearly, they, they're, in, they're into each other, and they're both... You know, he's not putting pressure on her, but she's, you know, the, this. And then in this, you know, they have her do that thing where, you know, she'll she'll walk, you know, be like walking away from him in in that kind of way of you know, and and you know, say, yeah, I'm fine. You say you're fine, but you seem like you know that that kind of that cliche that they had completely avoided. In the first two, and you know, he, he even says, I, "Have I ever pressured you?" And she's like, "You're a guy. Your mind's only on one thing." And and right there, you know, it, it's such a huge indication of just the complete nosedive that the writing, you know, the the specific dialogue, just the the thinking on it, you know, they. Yes, the both of them were so, you know, it's especially evident in her, so much more mature of a character in the first two, and just nobody wants to see this kind of situation. And it's also just frustrating that that's still, you know, they're still just there. There's, there's no, you know, and at least in the first two, that was, that, meant something. There was there was drama there. We we cared. Here it's just frustrating. But yeah, Iceman, you know, he's he's one of the Yeah, I I shouldn't give any details away, but you know, early on he he says that you know, the 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 students at the school most of us don't have anywhere to go. You know, you've heard of burning bridges. Pyro incinerated my parents' porch. I told him not to burn anything. Juggernaut is in this, and they they have him use that that line from the. You know, there was this like. Where, where some people made like a commentary on, a, I believe it was the 90s cartoon, and they gave Juggernaut a catchphrase. And finding that amusing is fine. I haven't watched it, but I can imagine it's funny. But you can't just take that and this is put in the movie and use it as that, that doesn't work. And they try to do that, and it's just ridiculous. And because, you know, it's Minnie Jones, you know, former football player, some of the moves are very much kind of football moves, and it just looks dumb. Again, I, I get it. I get, you know, you put Vinnie Jones on screen, you want to, like, you want to see him do some badass stuff. And I get, you know, saying, well, he, 
you know, let's give him some moves that are similar to, you know, the, the, I want to say that in, in Universal Soldier, The Return, Bill Goldberg uses some of his wrestling moves, as far as I understand. Don't get me wrong. It's Vinnie Jones. You know, he's fun, he's cool, he's intimidating. In Snatch, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, even Swordfish, not here. And some more on Rogue. She's jealous because the you know there's this training exercise and she sees Kitty and and Bobby kind of hug and it's really it's a real indication of Bobby just being a moron because he just stopped a projectile and then he turns his back as if there couldn't possibly be enough but again that's you know characters constantly making mistakes so that and and not having drive so that things can happen the way that, yeah, it's, that's the most inconvenient thing about stories. The characters might actually think for themselves or try to do something. It's ridiculous. But, yeah, you know, Kitty basically, you know, grabs and, and embraces Bobby so that the, the training, you know, so that they can both avoid a projectile. You know, she lets it phase through both of them. And this makes Rogue jealous in spite of the fact that she had just been, you know, not, not quite an embrace, but Colossus just touched her in order to, you know, and it's, it's that with the same goal. In both cases, you know, the, the person, you know, touching the, the you know, touching Rogue or touching Bobby is trying to use their powers to protect the other, and yeah. And she doesn't seem to care about, you know, there's no like, yes, I know I also touched Colossus, but that's different, or something. No, just, it's not mentioned at all. And she doesn't even care that he apparently just risked a coma for the sake of a training exercise, and that's also. I, you know, it frustrated me in the second one when they, you know, when a lot of the, the, yeah, when, when her power was diminished so much with no explanation for why, but at least in the second one, it led to some good stuff in this, it's just, and, and she doesn't even use her powers that much. It, it just makes, she's one of the people who want the cure, and we can understand why. Especially if her powers work the way they did in the first movie. If, the, if it was the way they did in the second movie, there's at least an inconvenience, but in this movie, she barely even uses them. They barely affect her life at all. So, yeah. Well, of course, there are an obstacle to her, you know, letting her guard down with Bobby, but again, much less so than before. You know, the fact that her powers are basically just, you know, yeah, this, this is why film rogue makes a lot less sense than comic rogue as far as taking her, you know, into battle and and really the only reason she's in the training exercise is so that she's in at least some I suppose I should say yeah you know it's it's so that she can see Bobby and Kitty yeah you know the the former viewer proxy and protagonist is barely in this movie and while this movie sort of resolves the Scott Jean Logan love triangle now instead we have the rogue Bobby Kitty love triangle and actually in the second movie it was kind of a rogue Bobby Logan love triangle so there really is at least one new love triangle per movie 
Pyro was so much more interesting in the second movie, and I mean, the, again, the actor does what he can with the material. The the it's the writing that lessens the character, not the actor and acting. But basically, he's been he's nothing but the the right hand of the right hand man of Magneto. He doesn't do anything, even. Like, in the first movie, Mystique still felt like more than just Magneto's right hand. And basically, he just, he follows Magneto around, and when, like, if he or Magneto are provoked, he barks, I mean, speaks, speaks up. He's not a dog. He just acts like one. Angel is also barely in this movie, and I really like Ben Foster. But they have him playing like the, the son of this upper class, rich, established guy. And it's just when I think Foster, especially around the time that this came out, I think like troubled youth who may get violent, maybe even lethal, you know, in response to provocation. I don't think like pampered, pretty, yeah, and it's, you know, his character, like a lot of the other, you know, his character from the comics is not here, the, the, not the, not the personality, the background, yes, but not the personality, he's, yeah, there's, there's nothing of the, you know, playboy kind of, yeah, just, and it's not, you know, it, it could have been there, but, yeah, he, you know, he basically doesn't have a personality. He's, he is a walking, he's, he's a mutation with two legs. That's basically it. It, everything surrounding his character is defined purely by the fact that he is a mutant and his father has has developed the cure. That's that's the one thing. There's there's yeah the and and their relationship and his father's character is also entirely defined by the fact that he is the father of a mutant and he developed the cure. That's yeah. Like in the first two movies, there are X kids in this movie also other mutants who casually use their powers. But in this movie, it's really dumb. And a lot of these powers, you can't quite tell what power the person has, or it maybe doesn't really make sense for them to be using it in that particular way or the like. There's this kid who walks and he you know, he has these two paper airplanes in front of him, and he sort of has them flying by, you know, having his hand up, and it's like, is he just telekinetic? We've had several telekinetic, just, yeah. The, you know, one of, among the worst uses of powers is Mystique shifts over and over when in captivity, when it couldn't possibly change anything. And it makes her look idiotic. And when she's taken on, you know, when she's shifted in someone, she does not stop talking. It's it's really obnoxious. The 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 strength of this character was that she said very, you know, she didn't she didn't speak very much, but what she said spoke values, volumes, and values for that matter. Maybe this is why she is always talking in first class as well. The only thing she manages to accomplish in this movie is an info dump, which she gets to share with Pyro, so he also gets a little bit to do, and, and so he wouldn't just be standing around staring in the scene, but yeah, she accomplishes nothing a 
computer readout couldn't have. And it just it feels like they had you know, they 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 had the makeup to make her naked and blue, and they had the effects to make her shift into other people. So they just decided, okay, we'll have her you know, spend some time in the, the makeup and then the rest of the time she'll shift into other people but it never means anything, it never matters. It makes her look like a child. She, you know, yeah, the, the she's face to face with this interrogator and he's like, I don't want to play games with you and then she shifts into him and says, you don't want to play games with me and it's just are you in the third grade? What is? That? And at one point, she shifts into this young girl, and she she says like, "When I when I get out of here, I'm gonna kill you myself." And it's like, man, before Nancy Callahan grew up and filled out, she turned really mean, and she actually has one of the best lines of her or any character in the films in the entire franchise she says my family tried to kill me that really says so much about her character and her relationship to the rest of the world and this, but then right before it she says she doesn't answer to her slave name and right after it she says you pathetic meat sack There's this really ridiculous bit where basically the, the two teams meet outside of the Jean Grey, you know, Jean Grey's parents' home. And we see the X-Men get out of a car and then walk a few steps. And then Magneto says something and then, a, you know, a moment later, the camera shows that he is also there, you know, basically the camera was at the side of the team as they walked and Magneto was just out of frame and it seems like before he said anything and before the camera showed him it was almost as if the other characters didn't realize he was there and that's just ridiculous how could... yeah and the I've long said that there were too few evil mutants in the second movie. When this came out, we got the reverse. And I have been eating craw ever since. These are also ridiculously easily defeated mutants. On Rotten Tomatoes, this movie has 58%. That does mean that it's rotten, but it's significantly higher than it has any right to be. And it actually, you know, it has 134 fresh and only 98 rotten, which is, of course, why it's slightly over 50 rather than under. More than slightly. And I mean, I read the the you know the brief summary of of each, and it seems like a number of the fresh ones don't really take into account that the first two were actually smart, had compelling characters, were socially relevant, and intelligently explored issues. This explores issues, but not in a very smart way. It's it's just very very like. I already mentioned the the you've got the Planned Parenthood thing, you've got this. There's there's one scene that Cinema Sins suggests might be supposed to seem like a clan rally, and that might yeah, I could I could see how that scene would be that. Yeah, it's it's just it's these really obvious allusions, and it doesn't really 
do anything with it. it doesn't really add to it it just says you know okay well now that there is a cure how might these characters react to it and I I buy that Storm would be against it that Rogue would be for it and such but I don't buy that they would talk about it in the way that they do the the first two movies would split up or disable the powers of mutants this one doesn't bother to do that instead the the mutants just don't use their powers in a smart way the you know the the tiny team of x men actually eliminate a ton of you know brotherhood mutants each we see the danger room and where in the first two it was supposed to be this realistic you know yeah something that could exist in in the real basically and you know both times it was cut for budget but in the second one they had really designed it you know with these I, I want to say it was like a cylindrical room with sections that would raise or lower at you know really high speeds and there would be holographic projectiles and yeah stuff like that that makes sense and I could see how that would work but then yeah in this it's basically the the holodeck and you know that of course brings up the the issues that people have with the holodeck that various have tried to answer and I'm not going to get into that. You can find that elsewhere. What I will say is the holodeck the holodeck is is quite a few you know, it's it's several hundred years away from now. Having it today is is pretty ridiculous and that really the the there are other things where in this that that are in this movie that work in the comics and are in the comics but don't work in the realistic world that this that has been set up in these movies you know Iceman completely ices out Kitty phases down through the ground and then back up with no spoken explanation of how. Again, that happens in the comics and I completely buy it there, but yeah, just and the you know, Xavier sends a psychic alert to the the various X-Men around the mansion. And actually speaking of how sci-fi the, the danger room is Wolverine lit a cigar in there. Does that mean that the fire was real? And he basically he tears off and then throws the the head of a sentinel. And I don't buy that he threw it and then it flew the way it did. And then it turns out he he steps out from behind it. I guess that means that he was he held on to the head as he so so did he not throw it did he just rip it off and then jump and then it flew that far and I also really don't buy that he was behind the head it's it's really and and I don't buy that if he was behind the head that we wouldn't have seen him before it landed and that he would just be able to step out from behind it as comfortably as he does The movie is 99 minutes, not counting the end credits, and 104 if you do count them, which does make it, you know, shorter than the second one. And the movie does have a post-credit sequence, which was a surprise to quite a few because it, it was, I believe, it's the first comic 
the movie to really have a post credit sequence. And it's actually an incredibly important one, and also one of those that are so vague that, you know, they explain on the commentary track what the idea is, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's too vague. Really, the, you know, as I dove into this movie, taking notes and, you know, yeah, noting all the different things that are wrong with it, really, every X-Men movie to date has some elements that just do not work or that are adjusted so that they fit a movie better than a comic and are thus really unsatisfying for comic viewers and such. There really, there hasn't yet been an X-Men movie that just decidedly, you know, okay, this, you know, the, the everything works and every single character needs to be there and, you know, there there's nothing in there that I hugely wish that, that's again something where the MCU did a lot better and or has done a lot better and yeah so far continues to and really the you know it's true that the you know the MCU would not exist in the form it does if not for the the first two of these movies but you really would kind of have expected them to eventually get from from where they started with this continuity to you know the yeah the entire film franchise to eventually get into a situation where it all just comes together i've reviewed other parts of this franchise the links are in the description box please comment thumbs up and subscribe for more content